Hello, and welcome to the Over 50 Health and Wellness Podcast. I'm your host, Kevin English, founder of The Silver Edge. Our mission at The Silver Edge is to inspire men and women in their 50s, 60s, 70s, and beyond to live their strongest, healthiest, most fulfilling lives. In this podcast, we share stories of amazing individuals who are doing just that to help motivate you to become the healthiest version of yourself, regardless of your age. And now, on to today's podcast. Hello, my guest this week is Dr. Jonathan Sullivan. Jonathan is owner of Gray Steel Strength and Conditioning, which is a barbell-based strength program for Masters Athletes. He is also an associate professor of emergency medicine at Wayne St. State University and Detroit Receiving Hospital, a level one trauma center where he has worked in patient care, teaching, and research for over 20 years. He is the author of several dozen research articles, abstracts, and book chapters on emergency medicine and neuroscience. He is also the co-author of a book titled The Barbell Prescription, Strength Training for Life After 40. Jonathan, welcome to the show. Thank you very much for having me, Kevin. I'm very pleased to be here. And likewise. So before we dig into, uh, I, I want to talk a lot about your book. Let's let's get to know you a little bit. What were you like as a kid? Were you were you active as a child? No, I was um, I was a bookworm. I was I was the nerdy little you know skinny bookworm. And uh, uh, about the time I got into junior high, I was uh, semi pudgy. Uh, nerdy bookworm. And then when I was in high school, I was a skinny, nerdy bookworm again. But the the constant factor was that I was a skinny bookworm and I was never particularly active. My two brothers were both very physical, very active. Um, but I was I was never anything like a jock. I wasn't interested in physical activity. Um, I, I like to sit around and read books and stuff like that. So I had no athletic background whatsoever uh, through high school. Uh, when I was 17 or 18, I graduated from high school. And because of a complex of, you know, unfortunate family situation and so forth, I didn't have any money to go to college and uh, I needed to get out of my house and uh, I had nowhere really to go. So I joined the Marine Corps. and. Um, then I became physical right quick, and um, and that was sort of my introduction to a physical existence. Was the United States Marine Corps? Yeah, they'll they'll do it to you, won't they? Yeah, no questions asked. Yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah. So so okay, so Marine Corps, and that's your first exposure to conditioning, yeah, chore, physical yeah, fitness, uh, to uh, to anything physical at all. Really, I remember being a recruit and then uh, my early days in the fleet Marine force. And it was because I had never been physical. I was kind of stunned by just how wonderful and pleasant that mode of existence could be. And all of a sudden I was very fit and I was very strong and I was, you know, I was, I was stronger than most of the people I went to high school with, even the jocks, you know, I was suddenly I was in great shape and that's cool. And I asked for and received uh, a posting to Okinawa. Once I was done with my secondary training, I was a legal beagle when I was in the Marine Corps and uh, worked in criminal justice and went to Okinawa. And there I was exposed to, you know, Okinawan and Japanese martial arts. And so that was another new dimension. And so that was about the time I finally became sort of a physical being, you know, my physical existence sort of came online a little late, but it came on, you know, like gangbusters when I was in my late teens. So you had that experience then with the armed forces and the Marines, obviously you went to, to medical school after that. Did you continue that that these for physical pursuits into your university years, or what did that look like? Yeah, there was a there was an interregnum between Marine Corps and uh, college. I uh, had a little bit of money left uh, from the Marine Corps. They didn't have the GI Bill in those days. There was a, a sort of a cost matching program, so I had some money saved. And but I went to work in the private sector after I got out of the Marine Corps. Lived alone. Did a lot of swimming and a lot of running. And, you know, a little bit of messing around with, 
you know, bench presses and curls and that kind of silly stuff. And then I finally got it together and went to college and medical school. And uh, again, you know, I continued to stay in shape. My major uh, focus was martial arts. I I started training in uh, Tongsudo, which is basically a Korean form of karate, very similar to Shotokan. And um, I was pretty consumed by that. And I can continued, continued to do a lot of swimming and running and a little bit of, you know, dabbling and weight training, didn't know what I was doing. And so, yeah, then I got into medical school and first couple of years of medical school, it was pretty easy to stay in shape. As a matter of fact, for some reason, when I got into medical school, I, I went to med school in Tucson. I had done my undergraduate training in Phoenix and my martial arts school was in Phoenix. And it turned out that when I was in med school, there were like four or five other guys from the same school who were also going to med school at the same time. So we had like this little club and some of the other students uh, came and joined us and their girlfriends joined us. And before we knew it, we had about 15, 20 people work out in the park two or three days a week uh, practicing Tong Sudo for the first couple of years of med school. And so that was great. And then the third year of med school happens and the third year is when you actually go to the hospital and the clinics and get on the wards and you're on call and pretty much anything like a healthy lifestyle comes to a screeching halt at that point. And so for the next uh, year or so, a couple of years, not so much, and then internship and residency. And I got positively pudgy and out of shape. And uh, my eating habits and sleeping habits and exercise habits were really quite deplorable uh, while I was doing my postgraduate training in medicine. It's one of the big problems with postgraduate medical training. Uh, just one of the many ways that residents and interns are abused uh, by the entire medical education process. So I got out of my residency, graduated from residency, became an attending physician, and also started a research fellowship out of residency, and discovered that I was really not in very good shape anymore at all. Um, and so uh, by that time, uh, I was 40, almost 40, and my conditioning and my strength were both pretty much in the toilet. And I spent the next decade or so trying to get myself back in shape and figure out what I wanted to do. I did a lot of martial arts. I did a lot of running. I had a freaking Bowflex. And, you know, I did uh, uh, I did this and that. It was a real good mission. There was nothing systematic about it. I, I didn't know what I was doing. And because I was a doctor, uh, you know, I hadn't had any real decent training in exercise medicine or nutrition for that matter. So I really struggled with my fitness and my weight throughout most of my 40s. Yeah, so that that's interesting that you say as as a physician you didn't have any any exposure to exercise medicine or nutrition and I think that we as lay people often look up to doctors as well of course they know what to tell me to eat and and how to exercise and and be healthy. So I think that that's kind of telling there. Do you want to elaborate on that any further? Yeah, uh they don't uh, uh, we don't. And when I was, you know, when I was in med school, we probably got a little bit of exercise physiology. Yeah. This is what happens to your cardiac output. This is what, you know, this is what happens to your minute ventilation. This is how you use glucose. These are the enzymatic systems. So, you know, it's sort of like the, the exercise physiology of what's going on, but actually the idea that exercise is a medicine and that it has to be prescribed and that it has therapeutic targets and doses and a therapeutic window. And it has these protein effects that are, that go far deeper and have a much more profound effect on, on health and healthy aging than any drug you will ever prescribe in your entire career. No, we didn't get any of that. And in terms of nutrition um, you know, we got a little bit of this and a little bit of that, but mostly it was about, you know, this is what happens to food when you eat it. This is how it gets metabolized. Um, these, this is what happens in certain food allergies. But nothing about prescribing a healthy diet for patients in medical school. Now, it may be that in, in the practice of family medicine or geriatrics or something like that, internal medicine, perhaps in the postgraduate training for those people, they get a little bit more instruction and training in how to do those things, but I don't think so. And it is certainly the case that in emergency medicine, we couldn't care less uh, about 
about that stuff because what we're interested in is shock and trauma and stroke and cardiac arrest and where, you know, the, the cat is out of the bag and the horse is out of the barn and, you know, it's a little bit too late for that stuff. Uh, what we need to do right now is to make sure that you still have a pulse uh, 25 minutes from now. And so I really did not in either my undergraduate or graduate education get very much training in these very, very important topics at all. And my, I suspect that most of my colleagues in other specialties also, I, in fact, I know that they are woefully lacking in that, in that level of expertise. It's a major problem with modern allopathic medical practice. Yeah, and I think that's been been my personal experience as well. And it was a little, frankly, a little shocking to me when it it dawned on me that my doctor really didn't have a good idea of not only what I should eat, but looking at my doctor, what he should eat, right? Or or, or even what he should or should not smoke, uh, yeah, right? Uh, one yeah. of the best, one of the greatest cardiologists I ever met, a, absolutely brilliant, brilliant cardiologist. Weighed 250 pounds, smoked a pack of cigarettes a day, you know, drank a big gulp every shift. Um, and uh, I remember asking him once we were going to we were going to thrombolize a patient. And I said, you know, should you know, what about if it's an inferior wall? And he said, you know what? I said, what if it was your inferior wall? And he'd say, to hell with my inferior wall. It deserves to die. You know, I, the, 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 like he knew he and he once said, yeah, I got to die of something. Um, so. Yeah, we're not we're we're really good in allopathic medicine at some things, but health maintenance and um, a healthy lifestyle and an exercise prescription and an appropriate nutrition prescription, especially appropriate exercise and nutrition prescriptions for a healthy aging after 50. Those people don't know in general. I don't want to paint with too broad a brush, but we don't know what we're doing as MDs, um, you know, so, yeah, it's bad. Okay, and that that's perfect because that's exactly what we're here to talk about, right? But uh, before we get there, let's let's continue on with your bio. So we we got you through we got you through med school, obviously the residency and whatnot. Uh, I, I think everybody has watched enough TV shows to understand that's pretty hectic life, and um, you had different priorities then. Certainly, health and nutrition not being one of them. But at this point, you've it sounded like you've you had the martial arts, you've done some some running, some other aerobic type stuff, and messed around like you said with some the bench the bench press, maybe some curls. Where does um, barbell training come in? Where, where do you find barbell training and, and strength and conditioning? So it's a, it's a little bit of a convoluted story, but I'll give you the Reader's Digest version. Uh, after residency, I entered a research fellowship, a basic science research fellowship through the Departments of Emergency Medicine and Physiology at Wayne State University, working in the lab of one Blaine White, um, a brilliant emergency physician. And the research focus in this lab was on brain resuscitation, molecular mechanisms of brain damage and repair after cardiac arrest or trauma. And I got very, very deep into what's what we call the growth factor story, the role of growth factors like insulin-like growth factor and brain-derived neurotrophic factor and insulin uh, in the possible resuscitation of brain tissue after cardiac arrest and trauma. And... Uh, I became very, very interested in cell suicide, which is very closely related to the aging process. At the same time, I was in my 40s, and uh, again, I was struggling. I didn't know quite what to do. I was still in better shape than the average 40-year-old American, but I, I knew that I was missing something. I knew I was losing muscle. Um, I had trouble keeping my fat levels down. I didn't know how to eat. I didn't know how to exercise. I tried to eat well, and I exercised regularly, but it was still a mess. And um, I remember one day I was surfing the literature on growth factors and I found a study, what I now call a bro bar blood study, where they took a bunch of bros and they measured their serum levels of growth factors and then they had them squat and then they measured the serum levels of growth factor again. And lo and behold, when you squat, you release huge amounts of growth factors into the serum that caught my interest. So then I started to think, well, maybe I need to do more resistance training. So, you know, uh, dust off the bow flex and like do more of that kind of stuff. And then a colleague one day brought me in um, his copy of Men's Health. And there was that article by Dan Duane, I think it was 2009 or 2010. I was pushing 50 at the time. And there was this article uh, 
called Everything You Know About Exercise is a Lie by Dan Duane, very well-written article, which said, you know, maybe we shouldn't be emphasizing all this cardio bunny stuff. Maybe what we should be doing is training for strength and adding muscle. And at the end of the article, he said, uh, if I could recommend one book, it would be Starting Strength by Mark Ripito. And I had sort of encountered that name before. It's like, why does that name keep popping up? So I got the book, I started reading it, and I was like, holy cow. Holy cow, this this guy was just talking right to me. He was so rational in his approach. And I just knew by the time I had finished reading that book and started my own linear progression, started that program of strength training, I knew that I had found sort of the missing fulcrum. I wasn't going to abandon martial arts and I wasn't going to abandon all this other stuff. And I wasn't going to eat exactly the way Ripito said, but I knew I was... I knew I had found something really, really important. And because I was a scientist and research was sort of like my modus operandi, I started looking, well, what is known about this stuff? So I started diving into the literature. By this time, I was like spending some time with Ripito himself, and we were collaborating on some articles and projects, and I certified as a coach. And I started looking at the literature on resistance training, strength training. And there was this whole world of literature. Most of it, quite frankly, of not very good quality, um, but a whole world of, of exercise science, nevertheless. And so it just kind of opened up to me and I started diving into it. And I started looking at the role of exercise in general and resistance training in particular in healthy aging. And I've been on that ever since. And from that reading, really obsessive reading and research and my own experiences. And by this time I was starting to coach, you know, friends and family and starting to see the impact not only on myself, but on others. And I knew that I had, I had found a new way of doing medicine for healthy aging. And uh, before I knew it, I had a book in my head and Andy Baker, who is a programming guru, uh, Andy Baker and I went to Mark Ripito and we said, uh, we think we got a book. And uh, and he said, go on, write it. And uh, and so we did and we wrote it and we published it. And it's um, it seems to have. Uh, change the curve for a lot of people, uh, just like it did for me. Yeah, that's and that's a great segue. Um, it certainly changed the curve for me as well. Um, reading that book, uh, it just was very, very impactful. Um, for those who don't know, the book is kind of broken out into, I guess, three sections. And um, that that first intro section just brought home so many things to me that maybe I subconsciously or intuitively had inside me somewhere, but it just brought it to the forefront and made so much sense. And I, I love that you call that a, a new way of doing medicine. So it sounds like 10 years or so ago, you discovered, like you said, it was that that article that said everything you know about exercise is wrong, started looking at um, resistance training from a scientific perspective. Is that fair? For, from Very a research, much. Mm-hmm. A research perspective and got the idea for this book and, and it, it got rolling. So that book was published, what, a couple of years ago, a few years 2016, now? 2016, actually. 2016. Okay. Okay. Mm-hmm. Um, so the book begins with an intro, and the intro is titled uh, Resistance is Not Futile. And your first sentence there says, A quiet revolution is transforming the way we think about health and fitness in the aging adult. Can you? That's a pretty optimistic statement, I think. Um, can you talk a little bit about how that's how that's coming about? So that that's obviously a big topic. We wrote a whole book about it, but I I, I think I can sum it up. The classic physician uh, driven prescription to the extent that there is one for healthy aging for for the most part the prescription is yeah eat better and get some exercise i mean i've i've heard myself utter those words in the clinical setting that obviously will not do as a prescription for what we now know is the most powerful medicine available which is exercise Exer- i say net we now know that it's the most powerful we've known since hippocrates we've known since the greeks uh, that it's the most powerful medicine available but there was a the revolution of modern medicine and pathology and antibiotics and and sick care instead of health care, we're starting to come around and say, no, uh, that stuff's all important, but 
it's actually the way we live is the most powerful medicine of all. So exercise is a powerful medicine. And even the physicians who were hip to that would say, yeah, you need to do your cardio. You need to go run and you need to, you know, and you should stretch and you, and you should do some, you know, some weight training and a little bit of strength training. But what you really need to do is run, you know, or walk and get that cardio in. And what we've seen over the last 10, 15 years, 20 years is a growing realization of the importance and centrality of muscle tissue, bone tissue, and strength to healthy aging. We lose muscle tissue as we age, and that loss of muscle tissue is ultimately catastrophic. Muscle tissue not only makes us stronger, it makes us more resilient to injury and illness, and it yanks on bones in a way that makes bones stronger uh, and more resilient to injury. And we've also come to realize that muscle is really the largest gland in the body. It exudes all of these signaling factors into the circulation. And so muscle is engaged in communication with bone tissue and pancreatic tissue and liver tissue and fat tissue and neurological tissue. So Muscle is a gland that secretes this whole slate of hormones that talk to other tissues and help modulate neuroplasticity and appetite and sleep and fat accretion and insulin sensitivity, you name it. And so for this tissue to be lost or to become dysfunctional in aging is just a disaster. Um, so there's this increasing realization of just what it is that retaining muscle does for us in terms of, of healthy aging. So how do you do that? Well, you have to retain muscle. Being a cardio bunny is not going to do it. You need to train the muscle. You need to do it with resistance training. And one more little piece of this puzzle. When you lose muscle tissue as you get older, you don't just sort of generally lose muscle tissue. Muscle tissue is a very heterogeneous and elaborate tissue. It consists of different kinds of muscle fibers, which we can roughly divide into two different types. Type 1 fibers, which are very generally speaking aerobic fibers. They're very small fibers and they're very weak fibers, but they will march all day long, right? They'll keep going all day long. They're the aerobic fibers or the endurance fibers. But there are also type 2 fibers, very generally speaking, which are very large, which are very high powered, very strong, um, and anaerobic, more or less, fibers. They're also much more expensive to maintain. And so as we grow older, we preferentially lose those high powered, strong, big, juicy, anaerobic type 2 fibers. So... That's a catastrophe. That means that we lose strength disproportionate to the amount of muscle that we lose, right? So it's not just that we're losing muscle, but we are disproportionately losing strength as well. And then finally, and we explore this in great detail in the book, there's the whole issue of conditioning. Nobody is downplaying the importance of conditioning, of aerobic conditioning and, and endurance as one of the general fitness attributes that we must hang on to as we get older. And since the 80s, there's been this idea that, well, you can train for strength and you can train for endurance, but you can't train for both at the same time because there's a fundamental interference effect between those two types of training. And in fact, it does appear to be the case that training for strength with weight training and training for endurance with aerobic training do seem to exercise some degree of interference with each other, although the full extent and the mechanisms responsible for that are still a matter of contention. But it turns out, and for this we have to uh, be grateful for the work of Gibala and Tabata and others, that when we keep our training in the high-intensity type 2 fiber anaerobic end of the energy spectrum, we derive all the benefits of training in the aerobic end of the spectrum. We hang on to our type 2 fibers. We don't suffer from that same degree of interference. 
So what is emerging is this picture that the aging adult must train for strength, must hang on to those type two fibers. And if the aging adult does both his strength training and conditioning in the anaerobic end of the energy spectrum, he will derive a very comprehensive uh, picture of fitness benefits. And he'll have the endurance, he'll have the strength, he'll have the body composition, the balance, the power, uh, all of the fitness attributes will be preserved simply by sticking to those high intensity exercises in the weight room and, you know, with high intensity interval training or uh, pushing sleds, uh, high intensity sprints, those kinds of things. So that is a real transformation in the way that we think about exercise in aging. And that's what we try to capture in the book and present in a very, very sort of systematic and rational way to make the case that if you're an aging adult and you want to stay in shape and you want to stay healthy, then your emphasis is not, cardio is not the fulcrum of your exercise program. The fulcrum of your exercise program is strength training with big compound barbell movements that train the most amount of muscle mass. And your your conditioning is going to be at the high energy end of the of the bioenergetic spectrum. So that's a, quite a mouthful there, but that's basically what we're talking about. Yeah. And you got, you're exactly right. You do lay that out very systematically and very well thought out in the book. Um, it, it walks you all the way through that step by step. And I, I think some people hearing this older adults, they, they may think that that's a little counterintuitive as well. I, I think a lot of us have heard, you know, as you keep seeing in the literature here and there, well, deadlifts, aren't, aren't they dangerous? Can't you hurt your back and squats? And we're going to put a pin in that for right now. I, I certainly want to sure. come, come back to that and, and attack that. But before we do that, I, what I found really striking reading through this book was your comparison of your fictional twins. I think they were Wellness Will and Fat Phil, maybe? Wellness Will and Fat Phil. Yeah. yeah. And, and you talked about the sick aging phenotype. So first, maybe kind of outline what you mean by a sick aging phenotype. And then if you don't mind, walk us through these two brothers' lives. They're identical twins, so they would have the same biological phenotype, I, I suppose. But wa walk us through that story a little bit, because I, I found that to be very, very compelling. Well, the sick aging phenotype is a, an idea that started brewing in my head a long time ago in, in clinical practice. As an emergency physician, I saw the sick aging phenotype multiple times a day, every day for 25 years of clinical practice. Um, what I saw was this, the way that we grow old in, in industrialized countries. And so when I started writing the book, that was front and center because that's what we're addressing. That's the disease that we're trying to treat with the barbell prescription, the disease of unhealthy aging. And I called it the sick aging phenotype. Phenotype is a word that just means show type. It's just the way an organism displays to us. So two organisms can have the same genotype, the same DNA, but depending upon their experiences and their diet and their exercise and what happens to them, they can end up with very different phenotypes. They can look quite different and their health can be fundamentally different depending upon those things, even though they have the exact same DNA. Wellness Will and Fat Phil actually came out of a pair of twin sisters that I encountered in the emergency department many, many years ago. And one of them was, you know, one of them was Wellness Wanda and one of them was, you know, Fat Francine. And they were as different as night and day. You could tell that they were twins, but their body composition, their health, their their ultimate fates were just as different as they could possibly be. One of them was just the picture of health. She was a stunningly beautiful uh, African-American woman, bright-eyed, in her 40s or 50s, lean. You could tell she was powerful from the way she moved. And she was there because she had brought her twin sister to the emergency department. And their, her twin sister was basically a big puddle of fat that filled up the entire gurney. She had diabetes. She had high blood pressure. She had cardiovascular disease. She had bed sores. She was just, you know, she had ulcers on her legs. She was just a total catastrophe. These were identical twin sisters. So 
there was nothing in their genotype. They were raised together. There was, you know, nothing in their early environment or their early diet. What it was, it was strictly a matter of lifestyle and experiences and nutrition. One of them worked out and ate well, and one of them didn't, and she smoked. And that was what happened to them. So in the book, we talk about wellness, will, and fat fill. Wellness, will, and fat fill start out as identical twins. We're taking the genotype off the table. We're taking genetics off the table. Different people have different genetics. Some people are more predisposed to get weaker or to have diabetes or so on and so forth. But if you take that off the table so that all you're left with is your way of life, right? Your lifestyle medicine, which can be a good medicine or a bad medicine, the outcome can be extraordinarily different. So that's what we're trying to do in the first chapter. So on the one hand, you've got Wellness Will, who eats well and exercises and lives well. And, you know, he's fortunate. He manages to escape trauma and general war or a pandemic or whatever. And, you know, and he basically just drops dead in his 80s, right? Uh, and that's, I think the way we had all like, you know, quick, right. But his brother, fat Phil, he doesn't fare nearly so well. He, you know, he does not eat right. He exercise, he does not exercise. He smokes, he watches TV, he eats bad food. And so where are we at with wellness? Well, well, where we're at or with fat Phil, we're in the sick aging phenotype. And the way we talk about the sick aging phenotype is this, it's a very, very, specific sort of meta syndrome, a syndrome of syndromes that in my experience in 25 years as an emergency physician go together more often than not. What is it? It is the metabolic syndrome, a well-described syndrome. When I was in med school, it was called syndrome X of insulin resistance, truncal obesity, which is really a surrogate for visceral obesity, fat around the internal organs high blood pressure, dyslipidemia, uh, cardiovascular disease, which eventually progresses to full-blown you know, coronary artery disease, stroke, heart attack, full-blown type 2 diabetes, um, and you know, morbid obesity, and uh, it's a disaster. Then there's also the frailty syndrome, sarcopenia, osteopenia, loss of strength and power. Uh, and then finally, there's what we call polypharmacy, which is simply a fancy word that means lots of drugs and medical dependence. So when I see fat Phil in the emergency department or fat Francine in the emergency department, and I'm not trying to use the word fat here derogatory, but fat is part of the syndrome, obesity, and particularly visceral fat, fat around the internal organs. This is not a value judgment. This is a medical judgment. That stuff is bad for you. And so Somebody who shows up in the emergency department with an extremely poor muscle mass index, an extremely poor body mass index, morbid obesity, visceral obesity, who's got high blood pressure, they've got insulin resistance or full-blown diabetes, they've got coronary artery disease, they may have already had a stroke or a heart attack, they are so weak they can barely sit up in bed, and they've got a Walgreens shopping bag full of prescriptions. They've got medicines to make them pee, they've got medicines to make them not pee, they've got medicines for their sugar, they've got you know medicines for dizziness, they've got medicines that make them dizzy, right? They've got narcotics for pain control, for their you know sort of nonspecific total body pain, um, they've got NSAIDs. Uh, which eventually take a toll on their their liver. They've got or, or on their uh, kidneys. So they, they've got this shopping bag full of medicines. We're like slowly poisoning these people in addition to the poison that their own lifestyle constitutes. It's a catastrophe, right? And there is just no way, no way that that is going to have a happy ending. And the only way to treat that sick aging phenotype, that constellation of pathological syndromes is with an extremely strong form of lifestyle medicine. That is a very dug in set of diseases and pathologies. And to root it out, you're going to need some heavy equipment, namely a squat rack and a barbell, right? That, uh, that's the only way you're going to be able to even begin uh, to get the bottom of that. There is no therapy, there is no pill, there is no surgery 
that is going to fix that. It comes out of the lifestyle and the lifestyle is what you have to fix. So let's take a minute before we start talking about that, um, that prescription and talk about the death phenotype. We already talked about wellness, wellness will, I think he, um, he, I think he was on a mountaintop with his girlfriend and just blew a valve and the next day was gone. Right. Um, what's that death phenotype look like for his brother? It's not so pretty, is it? It's not so good. So, um, in emergency medicine, we would use the phrase circling the drain. It's not a nice phrase, right? Or we would say old itis, you know, somebody, uh, he's got old itis, you know, and deconditioning and, um, and we would, you know, either admit him or send him home to continue the, the process of circling the drain. It's a long, slow, painful decline into weakness and despair and loss of independence and sexual impotence and more and more drugs and, you know, this sort of haze of, you know, narcotizing yourself with medicine and TV because you can't get up and go out and actually live your own life. So you just spend all your time watching other people live their life on TV and doctor's visits and your identification. How do you identify? You identify as a patient. Well, I'm a diabetic. I'm a hypertensive. You know, I'm a heart patient. Uh, I've got all these doctors. You know, I'm in all the textbooks. And like, that's your thing, right? That's where you live a significant portion of your life is in clinics and hospitals and emergency departments and Walgreens getting your prescriptions refilled and and in your lazy boy. And, and it just doesn't get any better. It gets worse year after year after year. And for Fat Phil, what did what happened? Well, he's like you know he's watching TV and he has the big one. He has you know the, the a big LAD lesion and he it, it clots off and he has a heart attack and he goes to the hospital and he goes to the cath lab and it gets opened up. You know his brother could have just as easily had that same heart attack, but his brother would have bounced back, right? But Fat Phil can't bounce back, right? He's got what emergency physicians not so politely call the three P's piss poor protoplasm. So his physiologic reserve is nowhere. So he can't, he can't confront that kind of injury or illness. We're all going to confront injury and illness uh, throughout the course of our lives, right? The question is, are we going to be strong enough to withstand that without being shattered, right? So I'd like to think that if I had a heart attack, I'd probably be okay, right? Assuming I didn't just drop dead from B-fib or something like that. I'd go to the cath lab, I'd get opened up, like, okay. And then I'd go on with my life. I'd be back under the bar the next week, if at all possible, right? But Fat Phil, he never has a chance. He spends six weeks in the CCU and he has blood clots and bed sores and complications and he gets pneumonia. And eventually he goes into multi-organ system failure and he dies, age 54 or something like that, Right. His brother drops dead, you know, hiking in the mountains 30 years later. That is what we call a sick death phenotype. And so part of what we're trying to do with the barbell prescription with exercise medicine is what's called compression of morbidity. We're trying to compress the dying part of our lives into a smaller and smaller fraction of our lifespan, right? everybody dies. The question is, how long are we going to take to do it? You know, fat fill takes a decade to do it, right? Wellness will takes a couple of seconds. That's his death phenotype, his healthy death phenotype. And I lived with this for 25 years, this horror show of seeing people in their 60s or their 50s or their 40s. And it's like, you are already dead dying, right? And the worst part of it is, isn't that you're going to die today or tomorrow or next year. The worst part of it is, is that you're going to be dying for the next 15 or 20 years. And then it's, you know, and then you're going to have a really ugly demise, right? Your life is over unless you do something. So that is a sick, that is a sick death phenotype, a sort of long protracted death spiral that just goes on for years or even decades. That is a living hell. And it, in most cases, it's completely unnecessary and completely preventable. 
And I think you can make a case that in most cases it's reversible. Is that right? At least partially. At least partially. Uh, you know, okay. things things can with living systems, as with all complex systems, you know, entropy takes a toll. So things can only get, you know, so disordered before you start reaching, you know, points of no return. So um, for example, if somebody comes to me and they have, you know, bad arthritis because they're obese and they have type two diabetes because they've burned out their beta cells and, you know, they've had a small heart attack already and they have high blood pressure all because of their unhealthy lifestyle. Well, we can arrest that process, that whole process to a degree. We can make them stronger. We can make them more powerful. We can make them more active and we can give them their life back. But we can't make the high blood pressure and the heart attack and the diabetes and the arthritis go away. You're stuck with that now. And that's what people don't understand, right? So people have it in their head that, you know, there's a pill or a surgery or something that will like, reverse all of this stuff. And it's just not the case for most of these things. And yes, medical technology goes on and perhaps someday we'll be able to replace your beta cells and, you know, you can get a knee replacement and, you know, but that heart tissue is never coming back. That brain tissue is never coming back. Those blood vessels are changed by all those years of being hypertensive. And so, no, I'm not going to cure your diabetes. I'm not going to manage your high blood pressure, but I'm going to do what every doctor wants to do, which is I'm going to manage them. The difference is I'm going to manage them by getting to the same process that caused them in the first place, which is your lifestyle. Instead of throwing medicines at you to simply, you know, physiologically control those parameters, which you're still going to need because you have those diseases. Now we still have to keep those parameters under control. But what we find is over time, your need for medication may become less intense even if it's not eliminated and those, those conditions will be better controlled. And the primary care physicians for my clients that I train in my practice, they are happy. They love what is happening to their patients uh, who come and train in the gym. They love their numbers, right? They love the fact that they're able to dial back the antihypertensive medications and dial back the anti-diabetic medications. They can't completely stop them in most cases, but they love what's happening to their patients. So it's a medicine, but it's a medicine that has to be taken for a lifetime. That's a great point. So there's, there's a couple of things here, right? To unpack. One is certainly that sick aging phenotype. Once it gets to a certain point, it's, it's not reversible, but it is containable or you can certainly improve the quality of life, right? It's your all hope is not lost. But the other side of that is for, and here's why I think your book is so relevant for everyone, of, regardless of your age, because A, we all know somebody over 40 who fits your, unfortunately, the description of fat fill. We all know somebody who has that sick aging phenotype. 100% of the people listening to this will, will be able to, to identify with that. And the other is that, you know, as we're younger, as we're coming into our 40s and our 50s, if we haven't gotten too far away, there's, there is, uh, there is a lot of strength to be gained. Um, certainly looking at your website and some of the videos on there, you see people doing amazing things. Um, so let's, let's switch from the catastrophe of the, of the sick aging phenotype and talk a little bit about the prescription. Let's talk about exercise medicine. So you alluded to it a little bit. You were talking about, you know, obviously compound lifts. Why don't you talk a little bit about what is that prescription? Well, very simply, it is a prescription consisting of around four, for most people, usually four, sometimes five, sometimes three, uh, total body movement patterns loaded with a barbell. So what we're trying to do here is um, use normal human movement patterns that capture a large volume of muscle mass uh, and a large effective range of motion. And and load those movement patterns. So perhaps, perhaps it would be best if I illustrated this by simply saying what would happen when somebody new comes to my clinic, right? So you come to my clinic and the way I begin this whole process is, you know, I tell you what's going to happen. And if you agree that you want to, to do this and transform your life in this way, the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to assess your ability to move, right? 
and I'm going to see what movement patterns are retained. And I'm going to be specifically looking at four general movement patterns, your ability to sit down and stand up, which we just call a squat, your ability to bend over and pick something up, which we call a deadlift, your ability to lift something up over your head, which we call an overhead press, and your ability to push something away from you, which we call a bench press, right? So I'm going to assess those movement patterns. Now, it may be, let's say you're an 88-year-old with um, you know, profound sarcopenia, and you, maybe you've had trauma. Maybe you've had a hip replacement. Maybe you just can't sit down and stand up on your own power, right? So for you, perhaps the squat will be out. But for the vast majority of people, those movement patterns will be to some degree or another retained. A lot of people drop out of the press because a lot of people can't really lock a load out over their shoulders anymore. And then we just replace that with another exercise. The point is that we find out which movement patterns you retain which full body movement patterns you retain. And my job as a coach is to be a total expert at loading those movement patterns with a barbell, which I am. So I find out which movement, which big movement patterns you can do, and then I load those movement patterns with a barbell. So let's say that I determine that you are going to be able to do the deadlift, right? Which is basically just the process of bending over, grabbing a barbell in the hands and sliding that barbell up your legs to a standing position. That's all a deadlift is, being able to bend over and pick something up. Hard to think of a more functional movement pattern than that, right? A more real life, natural movement pattern than that. So I'm going to instruct you in the deadlift. If you're very weak or aged or frail, I'm going to get a 15 pound bar and a couple of five pound plates, and I'm going to load that up on the floor, and I'm going to show you how to deadlift that. I'm going to take you through a set of five. And if you tolerate that well, maybe I'll add a little bit of weight and I'll get you up to maybe 40 pounds on day one. You'll be able to do five, a set of five deadlifts three times for uh, 40 pounds. Excellent. Okay. So you've done that. And then I'll take you through some exercises as well, other exercises as well, but let's stick with the deadlift. So Good. I'm going to send you home. I'm going to tell you to eat. I'm going to tell you to sleep. I'm going to have you come back in two or three days. And when you come back in two days, we're going to do the exact same thing. We're going to warm up again with that 25 pounds and we'll 35 pounds and 40 pounds was what you did last time. And then I'm going to take it up to 50 pounds. I'm going to have you do a set of five at 50 pounds. And we'll do the other exercises as well. They progress in the same way. I'm going to send you home. I'm going to tell you to eat. I'm going to tell you to sleep. You're going to come back in two or three days. And then you're going to do 55 pounds. And the time you come back after that, we're going to do 60 pounds. And the time you come back after that, we're going to do 65 pounds. This is the miracle of linear progression and the stress recovery adaptation cycle, which are well described. Not my invention. Just everybody knows, everybody who does this kind of work knows that they're out there. And it works Every time it is absolutely astonishing and people's, they can't believe what's happening to them just within the first three, four, five sessions. They're like, holy cow, how can this possibly be happening? This is like a miracle. And no, it's just biology. It's just the capacity of the organism to adapt to an increasing stress over time. And that's really all there is to it. That's the prescription identify the remaining movement patterns, load those patterns with a barbell, which allows for progressive overload. The miracle of the barbell is that it's ergonomic and it's safe. It allows efficient movement patterns and it allows exquisite dosing. So if you're particularly weak and particularly frail, maybe I don't want to add 10 pounds to your deadlift. Maybe I want to add two and a half pounds to your deadlift, or maybe I want to add a half a pound to your overhead press next time right? I want to progress you very, very slowly and very, very conservatively. With the barbell, I can do that. It is the most exquisitely dosable form of exercise medicine in existence. And as a physician, I appreciate exquisite dosing, right? I, I appreciate the ability to dose exquisitely. This is one of the things that got me excited about it in the first place. It fits all the parameters of an exercise medicine. And that's how it works. Eventually, there comes a point where I just can't keep adding weight to the bar for an exercise every single time anymore. Otherwise, people would become infinitely strong. But it's my job as a coach to be a total expert in knowing what to do when we reach that point, when the strength curve starts to flatten out and continue to increase 
strength over time with more complex programming and more slow advancement. But people still continue to advance for a very, very, very long time. I have a 94-year-old who, at least until the pandemic broke and he got you know locked in his assisted living facility, uh, was continuing to get stronger and stronger and stronger over time. And even now he's, you know, maintaining with a lockdown workout. So this is a medicine that keeps on giving over time. Its ultimate prescription is very well elucidated in the book and will, will keep providing benefits throughout the patient's lifetime. That's very well said. And I, I like the way you kind of walk through that, uh, like you said, that linear progression there. You um, talk about your prescription criteria in the book and you go into to great length and you, it's, it must be safe. It must be, you talk about the, it must be dosable. It must be comprehensive, must be effective. You have all these different criteria, how you come up with this prescription as being the, the optimum prescription. Talk a little bit to folks that might be hearing this and say, wow, barbell squats and barbell deadlifts for 80, 90 year olds, talk a little bit about the safety. Sure. To be safe, an exercise must first of all be exquisitely dosable so that we can progress it. And we've already talked about that. Squats, deadlifts, overhead presses, and bench presses are simply compound multi-joint movement patterns that we were designed to do. Like we were designed to squat down and stand up. That is a normal human movement pattern that catches a whole bunch of muscle tissue. And so the movement pattern itself is safe since we were designed to do it. Because we can load it very, very incrementally uh, according to the capacities of the individual client in front of us, uh, it's also safe in that regard. The other thing that's safe about barbell training is uh, it's environmentally safe. I don't mean it's good for the environment, but what I mean is it's performed indoors on a stable surface, in a controlled setting, um, the exercise is performed exactly the same way every single time. So there are no collisions. There are no unexpected joint torques or joint vectors or movement forces. So it, it's a very, very predictable, normal, sustainable movement pattern. And because it is a multi-joint movement pattern that captures such a large volume of tissue, it can be loaded to very, very high levels over time. People are simply amazed at how strong they can get, even in their 70s, 80s, and 90s. There are a lot of myths out there pertaining to, in particular, deadlifts and squats. The idea that squats are bad for your knees. I believe that Ripito has dealt with this dispositively, but to make a long story short, in a properly performed squat, uh, the forces around the knee joint are perfectly balanced and basically, you know, sum up to, you know, zero damaging force on the knee. In fact, what we universally observe over time is that people's knees feel better uh, when they squat and get stronger. The idea that the deadlift is bad for the back. Actually, we observe the exact opposite. People come to us with years of chronic back pain and their back pain goes away. Not in a few months, not in a few years, but in a few sessions, they come back and they say, holy cow, my back pain is gone, right? Well, why is that? Well, first of all, we're overcoming what some people, including my, my colleague Will Morris, call kinesiophobia, the fear of movement, the fear of using the back. And secondly, strong backs just don't hurt as much as weak backs, right? And then finally, there's a, a persistent myth that doing overhead presses will impinge the shoulder. Again, that's been dealt with um, definitively by Ripito, but to make a long story short, actually the way, we, the way an overhead press is properly performed strengthens the shoulders and ensures that they cannot possibly impinge. Um, and uh, it turns out that strong shoulders don't hurt as much as weak shoulders. It turns out that strong knees don't hurt as much as weak knees. And it turns out that strong backs don't hurt as much as weak backs. And what's great, mechanical low back pain is just ubiquitous because the low back is not particularly well designed by evolution. And uh, so back pain is just about universal in human experience. What we do with barbell training, all of these exercises, because they're structural exercises, they're performed standing, which is critical. So they train balance. But what they also do is they train us to use our back as a force transmitter. 
So for example, in the deadlift, we take we take no care to make sure that we're lifting with a vertical back, which is what all your doctors and grandmas will tell you to do, right? When we set up the deadlift, we find that our back is in some sort of non-vertical position. It's more or less horizontal. So there's a lot of so-called shear source, shear force acting along the back, right? We're putting a strain on the back. We don't try to eliminate that strain. We just deal with that strain. We just train our back to deal with that strain incrementally, safely, progressively, conservatively over time. And so what we find is that we make the back stronger. We turn it from a force absorber into a force transmitter. And that strong back, an effective force transmitter, effectively transmits force from the ground and the legs and the hips to the arms or to the upper back or to the hands. And that strong back will hurt far less often than a weak back. It's really quite simple. I mean, it's just not rocket science. It's just simple, brutally simple. So what you're what you're contending then is that properly done squats, deadlifts, and presses will make you stronger, and a stronger human body is a better human body, right? A healthier human body. There's no doubt about it. I mean, it's, there you go. It's, it, I, I mean, it's true on its face, right? Yeah. The thing, it's reciprocal. The thing speaks for itself and just as simple as it can be. And I think it was Ripito that famously said, uh, stronger people are harder to kill. Um, and, and, certainly, more useful, and more useful in general. And more useful in general. That's right. <laughs> well, okay. You alluded to this a little earlier. So anybody listening to this podcast in the future, we're recording this in July of 2020. We're somewhere in the middle or midst of the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, we just mentioned that stronger people would be harder to kill. What are your recommendations as a physician and a trainer for people that are potentially at risk or worried about being at risk at, at times like this? And not not even necessarily for for COVID nineteen, but things like you know you're you're at risk for for falls, you're at risk for flu, you're at risk for a lot of things when you're when you're not healthy and you're in that more sick phenotype. What sort of recommendations do you have for folks there? Well. This is a particularly difficult time. Um, so we're, you know, we, if you're hearing this and it's, you know, mid 2020 and you want to start a strength training program, uh, sadly, that's really tough right now because gyms are closed all over the country and building your own home gym, which is always a good idea. Uh, it's just about impossible right now because the equipment is not to be had because everybody else thought of that before you. So if you go to uh, the premier the premier manufacturer of training equipment, Rogue, in the United States, in Ohio, they don't have anything to sell and they don't know when they're going to. They're They're doing their best, but they just simply cannot keep up. You can't buy a barbell. You can't buy a squat rack. You can't buy plates. So it's particularly tough right now. This won't last forever, um, and eventually gyms will open again. Uh, in the meantime, I would still recommend that people get the barbell prescription and that they get starting strength and they learn what's in there. And there are what are called lockdown workouts, um, including on our own YouTube channel, Graysteel, uh, YouTube slash Graysteel. Uh, we have a lockdown workout that doesn't require barbells. Uh, all it requires is something that you can hold in your hands, uh, like a dumbbell, or people have been very creative with what, what they use for this kind of lockdown program. And do that. Start getting your, your strength back up. It's better to do something than nothing. The barbell prescription is an ideal, high-powered very intense form of exercise medicine because aging is the, you know, is the ultimate opponent and it takes a really strong medicine and a really strong form of training to meet that opponent in the arena of life. But if you can't do that right now, uh, simply because of the strange circumstances in which we find ourselves, you can still do something. You can still move, Right. You can do deadlifts with with water bottles. You can do overhead presses with you know weights, you know pots held in your in your hand. You can do goblet squats with a with a dumbbell uh, or something like that. And 
And then when we finally emerge from this catastrophe, you'll be in better shape than you otherwise would have been. And I have any number of online clients who no longer have access to barbells, and I am programming them in, you know, in, these, in the same movement patterns. I can't load them to the degree I want with barbells, um, but it's better to do something than nothing. So now's not the time to sit on your butt. Now's not the time to surrender to circumstances and say, well, I, you know, I certainly can't do that. Um, no, now's the time to educate yourself and to prepare yourself for the time, you know, when we all emerge into the sunlight and gyms reopen and you can start making a home gym or find a coach or whatever, um, because that day will come, nothing lasts forever. And, uh, uh, so that would that would be my advice. It really boils down to this. Eat well and keep moving because that's what human beings are designed to do. And when we stop doing those two things, we start to die. Yeah, that's very well said. So we should eat well. We should keep moving. And in this crazy time um, where you might not be able to do, you know, exactly what you want to do. And certainly the, you know, gym, gyms are very tough and you're right. You're not going to find, you're not going to buy a barbell anywhere online right now. Not for love or money. Yeah. Yeah. Apparently not. Um, but, and also buying the book, you had already referenced this a couple of times. Um, Mark Repito's starting strength is the classic on those movements. And then uh, of course your book, the, uh, the barbell prescription, I can put both of those in the, in the show notes as well. So maybe we wrap it up there. Why don't you tell folks where they can learn more about you and get in touch with you? Sure. Thank you. Um, we have a website, graysteel.org. That's G-R-E-Y-S-T-E-E-L.org. We have a YouTube channel, uh, also uh, Graysteel, G-R-E-Y, Graysteel. We have a Patreon page uh, for people who want to uh, join our private community, uh, which they can do for as little as a dollar a month. And the barbell prescription is um, by myself and Andy Baker, and that is available at either the barbellprescription.com or on Amazon. And um, if you just start there, you're going to find out a lot about us. We're on Instagram, we're on Facebook, but um, I would say check out the book on Amazon, uh, check out our webpage, graysteel.org, and uh, check out our YouTube channel where we've got lots and lots of material uh, that explores all of these things a lot further, everything to do with healthy aging. And just to clarify, do you offer uh, virtual or uh, online training services? So I'm associated with Barbell Logic, which provides uh, online coaching. Uh, my Online coaching practice is full. It's actually over full. <laughs> um, and uh, I spend uh, an hour or so each day engaged in online coaching. Um, and then I also have a, a brick and mortar practice, uh, Grace Steel in Farmington Hills, Michigan. Obviously, uh, we've been affected by the pandemic just like everybody else, but we're looking forward to the time when we're going to be able to uh, open our doors again. Uh, we actually have a limited number of spots uh, because we find that once people uh, join us, uh, they never leave. But uh, if there, if people are in Southeast Michigan in the Farmington Hills, Detroit area, uh, once the pandemic is over and all the restrictions are lifted and you're interested in coming to train with us, we'd love to see you. We also offer consults. So people have come from as far away as, uh, you know, as Canada and even overseas uh, to train with us and get consultation on their programming and on their form. Hopefully we'll see some of you when the sun comes back out again. Yeah, on, on the other side of this. On yeah. the other side of, on the other side of this. Yes, absolutely. Well, certainly I want to reiterate that the barbell prescription strength training for life after 40 should be required reading for everybody. Certainly if you're, if you're at 40 or over, but uh, if you know somebody who is, or if you know somebody who has that sick aging phenotype or is heading in that direction, this should be required reading for you as well. I'll drop all those notes in the show notes as well. But Jonathan, thanks again so much for coming on, sharing all your knowledge with us. Um, this was a great conversation. I'm sure a lot of folks are going to take away a lot of things here, a lot of, a lot of food for thought here. It was a real pleasure, Kevin. Thank you so much for having me.
Well, that's our show for today, folks. If you enjoyed today's episode, please tell your friends and please consider subscribing and giving us a five-star review. All the show notes and much more are available at our website at silver-edge.com. That's silver-edge.com. So until next time, stay strong.